Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, I'm Dan Marotti. Hey, this is Nasty Shags, and I'm here to get nasty with this son of a bitch over here. Let me tell you something. If you think that's bad, you should hear what Linda called me this morning. That's a different story for a different time. Brand new Wrestling Insiders is coming up next. Stand by. Boston Wrestling Sports and the MWF explodes into a new year of unknown with professional wrestling content galore, and we need you to join our family every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. after we review the previous night's Monday Night Raw. It's Wrestling Insiders at your house with the unpredictable WWE Hall of Famer, Mr. USA, Tony Atlas. Wednesday nights after WWE, NXT, and AEW at 10 p.m., you never know who's going to show up on Wrestling Insiders Special Edition. Every Thursday night at 10 p.m. after our NXT and Dynamite review, it's Marty Jannetty's No Holds Barred, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Journey Through the 80s and 90s on Wrestling Insiders Party with Marty. Friday nights after the lights go down at the Thunderdome on SmackDown, it's John Cena Sr.'s Wrestling Insiders Fabulous Fridays. Plus, look for classic clips, bonus live episodes, pay-per-view watch-alongs, and more. If you want early, ad-free access to all of our Wrestling Insider talk shows, our acclaimed studio shoot interview DVD library, and to help keep wrestling legends working during the worst of times, for less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks, join our growing family at patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling. Expect the unexpected in 2021. Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, we continue to be nasty here on a special edition of Wrestling Insiders. I'm Dan Marotti, along with our new friend, Jerry Sags. We continue to break down a, a, a tremendous career that, that is still going strong in 2020-2021. Yeah, I uh, like doing what we're doing. I mean, uh, these circumstances are fucked up a little bit, but... Uh not a little bit, a lot with the, uh, the you know, the uh, virtual signings and stuff like that. Uh, what at, at this point in the stage of the game, um, you know, we like to get out to these comic cons and shows and li whatever live events to see our old buddies, and and, and uh, it's almost like everyone's a reunion. Yeah. You know, we just we, we can uh, hang out and party together and have fun. You know, and and, and the fans get to see us too. I miss that. You know, the virtual thing is okay, but. Hopefully we get back to normal here, you know. Knock yeah. on wood, believe me, believe me. The, the sooner the better. But let's talk about December of 1990. In the World Wrestling Federation, Ultimate Warrior was the World Heavyweight Champion, the late great Mr. Perfect, the Intercontinental Champion, Bret Hart, Jim Neidhart, World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Champions. And enter into the equation, uh, it was uh, kind of a, a, a lull in the company at that time. If you look at the house show business in 1990, it was starting to, to drop a little bit when the Hulkster went off to do a movie. Warrior is the champion wasn't exactly lighting the, the place on fire. Dusty Rhodes uh, uh, headlining the B-teams really wasn't doing much. He had Tugboat headlining some house shows. So WWF, they decided to freshen things up in late 1990 and early 1991. And something to help the cause was to bring Brian Nobbs and Jerry Sags into the company. What? Uh, how did it come to be? Who reached out to who? What kind of a contract was offered and for how long? And so on. Well, if you take, you know, you, things can't just run forever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, Hulk uh, obviously was cutting off to do those movies and get another shot in the arm there because nothing, nothing could top that, you know, that early 80s, that all through the 80s run. Right. You know, those first couple WrestleManias and whatnot is what made the wrestling business what it, what it is today. Um, uh, back to us, um, we, uh, I can't tell that whole story or start with all that. I, I, we just talked about that and the other, other thing, but, uh, we, uh, had paid our dues pretty much, you know, we're taught the right way. We, we broke in, um, via Vern Gagne's camp. Uh, Brad Reagan's our coach sent there by George the Animal Steel. Uh, 
Matt Millen made the call for us, our, our hometown good buddy. Uh, Brad introduced us to the first person we meet living in Brad's basement, Kurt Henning. The next person we met was Hawk, two of the greatest guys in our life. And then we went AWA down to Tennessee, did a year down there, back to AWA, met Steve Kern down there. Uh, and then he brought us to Florida. While we were in Florida, we got to be friends with Greg DeHammer Valentine. And uh, his wife, Julie, was friends with Brutus and Hulk. And a lot of the guys at that time lived there while we were wrestling for Florida Championship Wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bushwhackers, the Hulk, Brutus, uh, Macho, everybody lived in that area down there. So we'd run into each other and that type of thing. But um, we... Uh, you know, we were on our way doing things, and uh, Greg the Hammer uh, said, hey, we were wrestling in Florida. said, George Scott's a good buddy of mine. He was, we were talking about Pat Patterson also before. Uh, George Scott was the booker for WWE prior to Pat Patterson. And him and Johnny Walker, Lou Thez, uh, uh, Paul Jones, and those old timers were bringing back the NWA mm -hmm. in Charlotte. And uh, so we started flying, me, Robert Fuller, and Nob started flying up and taping TV up there and ended up living in Charlotte and coming back and forth to Florida. Well, G we met Gene Anderson there. And at that time, Ole Anderson came in to book at the WCW. Now, this is the late 80s. And uh, Gene told Ole about us. We went back to Florida for a while to wrestle. Ole Anderson showed up, and at that time, as you're saying about the WWF at the time, he was looking to bring an influx of new talent into WCW. Um, he saw us wrestle at the Sportatorium, and Ole went right to Mike Graham and said, I want to bring these guys up, uh, and asked them all about us, and Mike was like our dad. Steve Kern, we were there because of him. He, he weaned us and took care of us because of Kurt telling Steve Kern about us and us meeting Steve Kern in Tennessee. Uh, we went back to Charlotte, where we lived at the time. And Gene came up to us, Anderson, and said, uh, Ole wants me to bring you guys down to, to, to tape the television show. We went, OK. Little did we know, it was Clash of the Champions. Oh, wow. In, uh, I think it was Clash of the Champions in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. So we went from Charlotte to Asheville in Gene's old car. There was gas pouring out of the carburetor, no air conditioning, clunker. We thought it was going to blow up. We get there, and we end up, we're going to put you on the Clash of the Champions, Ole says. I mean, this is how things went back then. It was a lot of it was off the cuff. And uh, I'll tell this again. If, when it, your time comes and you're handed that ball, you better be fucking ready. Right. Because it might not come again. So he put us together with... Is it Bob, uh, with Terry Taylor and I think it was Bobby Fulton? Okay, I, or, or was there two Fultons, right? Bobby's kid just did something. But if, I think Bobby Fulton took Terry Taylor. Terry Taylor goes, hey, uh, you know, we were very close. Sean, Sean told me a lot of good stuff about you. And really, Terry took care of us. We developed a map, we, a match, where we, we took some double hellacious bumps and stuff. and. For, and we were nervous as hell, but it was a live clash of the champions. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what match we were or whatever, but it, it, it got over. And then after it, thank you. It, it, that was mainly because of Terry Taylor and them guys working with us, because they could have dumped us at that time. Right. And, you know, but he, he took care of us. And we, we really, it got over. The match did good. We went back, we go back to uh, uh, Charlotte with Gene. We wrestled there a little more, and we go back to Florida. Um, and uh, come back again to, to Charlotte to tape TV. And Gene goes, hey, Ole wants you guys to come to Atlanta uh, to tape television. And we just, we said, great, you know. And we'd have no deal, no nothing. That's how it was back then. He goes, I'll give you 300 bucks for whatever a day to tape a TV. We said, great, it was good money to us, you know. <laughs> All right, and like you were talking about contracts, how that went. Yeah, yeah. We, we were just glad to have the break, so we'll put you on TV. So then we wrestled, and we just went out and went 
we know this could be our chance. We did our whole nasty shtick and went crazy. Next thing we kept coming in and he brought us in. And uh, then we came and moved that we were WCW. He goes, listen, I'll give you so and so much a night, not much money. And he brought in, I think, at the same time, uh, Art, uh, Art Bar, which mm -hmm. was uh, Jesse Barr's younger brother. He was going as the juicer. Roddy Piper broke him into business. We met him in Japan when he was just a kid. Eddie Guerrero was just a kid, and Chris Benoit were young, just starting. And they were wrestling lightweight in Japan. So we knew Art Bar. And another kid from JW Storm, a couple other guys. But the ones that made it out of it were, out of all the people Ole brought in at that time, were just me knobs, and maybe the, he was a juicer. Uh, he's, he's passed away since then. But uh, um, we started doing TVs. And we land in, we land in uh, Chicago. We're doing a pavilion. And this is another thing. He goes, Ole calls us over and says, uh, I want you two to go out before the show and do a live interview with these people. Okay. And there's another thing. When you're handed the ball and you go out there and you take a shit, yeah. I go, we were nervous as hell. But we've been through this before because of their experiences, how we were taught. Our experience at AWA and Tennessee and everything down there. Uh, we go out and like we, we, we owned it. And basically, I started to think, oh, first of all, you know, in, in, a, in a way, roundabout way, um, we ain't no South Side scumbags. We're, you know, you know, New York City prime. You're deserving, that, you know, in a place just to rot. I mean, me and Nobbs cut an interview, come back. And it got over. The people wanted, we were almost murdered because of calling them South Side scum. And we, yeah, we knew yeah. how to tweak them. We wrestled in the AWA in Chicago, a different thing. That pavilion was a close thing at the university down there. You know what I mean? And then um, this is how this whole thing progressed. It was not like it wasn't written down, no writers, no nothing. Old school. Ole goes, uh, he's seen it got over. And he knows he saw what we were doing on TV. So um, we're going to, he tell, calls us again. He goes, we're going to tape something. Uh, I'm going to set up. You, you to wrestle these Steiner brothers uh, uh, for Halloween Havoc or, or down the road. Um, let's do a, a signing, a contract signing for the belts. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, you know, mix it up a little bit. You know, like, a, you know, like the old boxing things, you know, you go, and Muhammad Ali, and uh, we go, okay, we'll mix it up a little bit. So this is all just, so uh, the Steiners, we walk out. We're, the people are already mad at us. We, we just keep getting the heat, screaming at them, F you, tell them to F off, and that kind of thing. And they're throwing shit and everything. They have a table set up with the contracts. And the, the, now the Steiners come out, big pot. Oh, oh, they're barking. You know, we never worked with them yet or nothing like that. And, uh, you know, and Ole in his head thought, you know, these amateur guys, these crazy bastards, with these crazy bastards, he's thinking... This could work. So we go out. They sign the contract. We sign the contract. And they, the, the Steiners didn't know this. We didn't tell them what, not anything we were going to do. And we, we, me and Novice picked the belts up off the table and look at them. And you know, we hold them up, the people boo. And we just turn. And I hit Ricky Steiner in the face as hard as I could with that belt. Blew his eye open from here to here. Really? Busted him all. Bam. Knocked him. And then it just late, Knobs took, went right over the table and punched Scotty in the face. But same thing, whapped him with the belt. And, and it was a crazy flurry of intense fighting that hasn't been seen like that on TV in a long time. And, it and got it's a, missing from the it, business and, right and it, now. And it got over. It was so real and so intense, it got over. Okay, now we go and start with the Steiners wrestling around the horn. All the way up from that time in spring, or whenever that was, all the way through to the apex of it, which was the Halloween Havoc match. That match, nobody could follow. I think he, he, Rick, uh, Rick and I mean, Randy was there, or it was Rick and Lex, uh, the matches that had to come after it, because uh, at the end of that match, um, 
Knobs got beat with the Frankenstein. It was such a brutal match. And at then, to get our heat back, we took and plump, bludgeoned him. And then we posted Ricky five times or so or into the steel post, double posted him. And then Scotty chased us. We ran off. And it had such a overwhelming, I mean, the, the noise, you would not believe, it could hurt your ears, the, the, the reception that match got. That was what propelled us to the next level after that match. Now, in that match, Scotty got me back in a way because he pelted me with a ch on the back of the chair. The top of the chair put a two-inch gash in the back of my head. No, oh, jeez. When I got Scotty in a Boston Crab, I'm like this. All of a sudden, I see blood dripping down. My, the blood's coming from back up here, but it's, I'm like this, choking him in a Boston Crab or the camel club, whatever it was. I think I had his legs in the, bo in the, my, the Boston Crab or the camel club. And I'm going like this, and there's blood. I go, what the hell? Where, where'd that come from? <laughs> I got hit in the head, but late I realized there's a big cut in the top of my head. After that whole Halloween Havoc match, Ole goes, now he's really thinking. He's putting it together. He goes, all right, Scotty Steiner, we're gonna, you're going to do a live interview about us hurting your brother and the Nasty Boys. He goes, Sags, um, put this on. I go, what? He goes, I got a, this cut in my head. He goes, he goes fuck that cut. And I got to, what about they wipe the blood off his face? <laughs> you know, they put him, they, he gives me a beard and a vendor hat and then hands me a, 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 a big bin like a vendor with popcorn. He goes, when Scotty's doing his interview, you come up like a popcorn man and then you guys beat him up. I went, okay, my head's <laughs> bleeding. I'm straight after the match. And there's Scotty. Spit flying out of there. Eric Bischoff, I think, did the thing. You nice, because we, we, we knocked his brother out after the thing. We're coming back, Brandon. And I'm in popcorn, popcorn, <laughs> you know. And then all of a sudden, they're talking there, and I'm in the background. You see me back there, raise up the thing. I had a board. I put a piece of plywood in the thing, in the oh, bottom okay, of it. Yeah. So I, cause it who, you know, so because I had something to hit a plywood under there, a thick piece I found backstage underneath, so I'd have a board to hit him with the thing, and then put the popcorn on top. And bam, not busted over Scotty Steiner's head. He goes down. Now Knobs comes out and joins me. Pick, we beat the living shit out of him. And it just went from there over the top. And this is how fast things happen in the business. And like I'm saying, when you're, we paid enough dues, five, six years, territory to territory, learned, worked with the right people around the top of the top of the business uh, at the right times to learn off of. When that ball was handed it to us, we knew what to do with it. And that's because it was still territories to go to and work and learn. And that match put us in a whole other light. And it was seen at that perfect time you're talking about when WWE wanted to revive their thing. Now, they knew, well, what's it, the yellow D against the hearts and or this? It, we fit a void to come in there and start mix things up. And at that time, now that got over, here we are getting X amount of dollars per night. Now we got a contract that nobody would turn down. And it came down, I think we were in, oh, what town? Somewhere in Georgia mm -hmm. at a TV. And I think it was Jim Ross, uh, was Paul Heyman, was Paul Dangerously was there. I'm pretty sure he was there, um, but he had nothing. But Jim Ross was with Jim Hurd. He was Turner's head guy, came, and they put us in a room, and they puts the contracts down. You know what I mean? Well, we, want, we want to have you here, you know, it was a, a, a probably three, four, couple-year deal for a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, low-end, uh, low uh, 300 to a half million dollars each, which where we are making a couple hundred, three, four hundred dollars a night. dollars a night, you said. And now yeah. they're con that's how this works. You go, it, it goes. Uh, and hit, But they didn't already know, after Halloween Havoc, we went home, that we, we are, had already met Hawkster in Florida and went to his house. Uh, he, he came to our restaurant with his family. He, he invited it to the house, at the house, when we were in, at Florida Championship Wrestling, was... Vince McMahon, Shane, Pat Patterson, 
the Bushwhackers, Greg Valentine, Macho Man, Brutus, all the gang was there. And we were just at Florida Championship Wrestling, and he invited us over. You know, because we had the nod from Greg, hey, these guys are pretty cool. Yeah. We were like in, like, you know, being in a room with movie stars at the right. time. We were this lowly Florida Championship Wrestling champs, you know. But we were there. The Hawks come over. He came to eat at a restaurant. He said, come over to the house. All the guys are coming in town. And then so we met and that type of thing. So after Halloween Havoc, we went home. And then Hulk calls up Nobbs, goes, hey, it was a great time. He goes, listen, uh, Vince wants to talk to you guys. Nobbs goes, shut up. That's what he you know, you know, you know, this is after the Halloween Havoc. We're, before we go back, even went back to get those contracts put in front of us. And uh, Nobbs will tell you the story too, but Hulk goes, no, I'm serious. And he goes, okay, so Vince called me and Nobbs and said, I want you guys to come in, uh, you know, and laid it out. And we, we went back to TV. And it went, again, we went back to television. But before that, we talked to a few people and said, some guy said, don't go. Take this money. You, this is, you can't guarantee. pass this money. You take it. One guy, and that I, I'm pretty sure, and it, and it was the same guy again, it was Terry Taylor, goes, Listen, I know what these guys are telling you. I know that money sounds good right now, but if Vince McMahon's calling you at this point in time, this can make and break your career because you've got to make it up there to make it everywhere else. Right. So me and Nob said, all right, me and Nob's talked about it a little bit, so we knew what we were going to do. They, we met about an hour later, Jim Ross and Jim Hurd and then pull us in the office and go, here, boom, they put the contract down and glad we want you to be here. We go, um, we're sorry, but um, we're sorry, but uh, uh, we, we're going to turn this contract down. We're, gonna, we're, we're leaving for uh, to go work at WWE. Yeah. And that Jim Hurd went, God damn it, and fucking threw the contracts in the air. And Jim, uh, Jim Ross goes, you're making a big mistake. And then, and then, and then he went to this, and I think it was Jim Ross went to the Steiner and said, fucking beat him. Fucking, then, then they said, I have no problem on the way, and the Steiner said, and the Steiner's actually said, respect, said, no. They said, well, uh, we'll do what we want to do. Because <laughs> we, uh, we, we had that bond with mm -hmm. them. Because we put them over everywhere and worked. We're the only team that we, they, not only did they put us to another level, we put, we, we, by having those great matches, put their, them as yeah, a tag, hot angle. By yeah, a tag yeah. team to another level. We did that together. Mm -hmm. And there was a bond with us and the Steiner since, ever since that time. So we did it. And that was the last time we saw them, you know what I mean? Until we came back. When we, you know, we, we came back to WCW in uh, 94 or whenever the hell it was. Yeah. You know, after our run with the, uh, and then going in uh, to WWE, which I, I say now, but it was WWF, and there there was no big. Vince McMahon told us outright. He said, "We don't sign guarantees here," and it was that the independent wrestling contract. You know, uh, you you sign, I give you the ability to work, but he goes, "I guarantee I'll make you more money." And we took his word, and we did. We took his word for it. And we just did it. You know what I mean? It's a, a, it's a risk, but like you, the, timing is everything. Right. That, that match pushed it to the next level, which led us to the biggest match of our ever our career. If there's one match, people always ask. There's a lot of great ones in there. The Rockers at Royal Albert Hall and, and you know, Macho and Ultimate Warrior and so many. I could, all the tag teams we wrestlers. The, the, the Bush, uh, the tag teams were huge back then integral part of the whole car an important part of Very the show important. instead of an afterthought yeah. like it is yeah now. or just throwing two guys that don't know each yeah. other hawk and no animal chemistry. grew up together the harlem heat grew up together uh um brett and jim were brother-in-laws you know when it, you know sean and marty were together for years before we worked with them in wwe we had some of the greatest matches but that led we first worked undertaker left uh he was mean mark he left uh a month or so before us, we came right after him. We came into WWE at the same time, mentioning our great old friend there, the, the, the bearer of the urn, Mr. Bearer himself, uh, at the same time. And so we were sort of coming up at the same time. Uh, 
Undertaker stayed there for 30 years. We were asked politely to leave. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had a little longer of a career than us. Maybe maybe made a few more dollars. <laughs> couple, one or two, yeah. Yeah, a couple bucks. But but you know, it is what it is. We are who we are. But that led to one of the greatest matches ever. And I talked to you know, not becoming friends. And I'm talking about the Hart family is like family to us. Brett, every, you know, uh, Davey. We, we, we stayed at Stu's house with Davey and we were ribbed by him there and Brett and Owen and all the hearts and, and uh, Diane and Ellie and uh, I knew Harry, Natty, when they were little kids, oh, they were wow. at my house, you know what I mean? But to wrestle, even Brett talks today, he goes, yeah, I, I watch that over and don't realize what a great match he had at WrestleMania 7. And it was, it was the highlight of our career, you know what I mean? It was, it was wrestling the hearts and we wrestled them up through the whole loop around, coming all the way up to that final match, and nobody called that one. You know what I mean? When no, we went, I don't think a lot of people we, expected we, it. As when, a young fan, I didn't. And we had tremendous amount of old school heat by stealing those belts from because they loved the anvil and, and Brett were over. You know what I mean? But our job, I knew, in the long run was to get as much heat as we can. And that Pat Patterson was a genius of by throwing us in the there with those mixes with Macho Man and all that stuff, and any time we could catch heat. And when we won, we go back in the backstage area in, at WrestleMania 7, who's standing in front of us is Donald Trump and Vince McMahon. And who's doing our interview? Trump's wife, Marla Maples. Vince goes, nobody touch Marla and, you know, take it easy. And that meant to me, I, I saw Vince's eyes meant, you know, rough her up if you want, <laughs> you know. And then so Donald Trump and Vince are standing there, and Marla Maples is doing the interview. Who walks in with champagne? Roddy Piper, the Mountie, <laughs> Dino Bravo, all heels at the time. Yeah. yeah. And we're screaming, dumping champagne, and just getting um, furious amounts of heat. And that heat carried. I mean, it, it, coming to Boston and Chicago, and then coming with the LOD chasing us, it was, it, I mean, we, we were, it was selling out everywhere. A tremendous amounts of business. Marty said that she was pretty pissed that she got doused with the champagne. Who? Oh, the Mala you know, Maples. The, yeah, yeah, she yeah. was. She, because she didn't, you know, she didn't know it. But you know, <laughs> I, I think Vince and Trump were laughing. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? And now I'm sure Don would say after he leaves the White right. House, go, I'm glad you doused her with champagne. She divorced me a couple years later. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd like to see that over. I've never seen it since. I don't know if it's on of those old WrestleMania Probably things. on the old on yeah. WWE Network. Yeah, yeah, it might be on there, but it was classic. I'll what, tell you what, that. What were your first thoughts of Vince McMahon when you met with him? Uh, they, they just very, very business. Mm -hmm. uh, like a straight up, uh, straight talking, no nonsense, just businessman. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But, I, but it, it didn't take him long to get tired of our antics. <laughs> you know? Uh, we, uh, we were at a stage where life, when we, 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 we got the hit start when we were young there and we were pretty, you know, we had that this right here in Boston, we, we had Shane with us along on the road, a lot of our road trips and we're, we were in a, we were in, in a crazy time, 300 days a year on the road and partying with Hawk and, uh, just cr the Sean and Marty and the whole gang, Kurt. I mean, it was a rough, rough road and we got into some crazy shit I mean crazy stuff you know what I mean but back in the day there wasn't the name of the game wasn't going somewhere and sitting there for 90 years you did your run which our job we did was we, we, we wrestled with the hearts and then our run with LLD when that was came to an end we did we were gonna do like a baby face thing and uh, the, the, the thing on it was on the end of that was WrestleMania 10 uh, we got bumped out uh, because you were nine or nine and it was in, in Vegas. Vegas yeah. yeah, that was our last WrestleMania, which we were going to we were, we were going to work. We worked the program all the way up with Money, Inc. And at the last minute, I think Hulk had gotten an accident or something happened. But he beat he that same night, the same thing. Uh, Brutus got in that accident and hurt his face. His face got torn off of his yeah. face on a, the, the parasailer, parasailer hit him. And he was what he wanted to come back. So Hulk put Brutus with him, and it was a last-minute thing. And they bumped us out of the spot and put themselves in there with things. So Hulk, uh, that night, 
beat Yokozuna, and they beat Money Inc. for the belts, which was our spot. And after that, we were pretty much, you know. You were we, gone we, within we, a we, month yeah, or two. We were, <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not because we, 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 cause of the way we acted, we were called in into the office and we said we, we said we want to you know we, we, we were being it was it was pretty much known we we knew we were going and they knew they were they it was time you know and Vince gave us a full release we flew right from there and flew right to Atlanta and drove right to C one CNN Center and went up to Dusty's office and said well we're done up there here's a release you know, <laughs> they were then the rest was history. That's how it worked. And you were in pretty quick. Yeah, yeah we were you there were right real there. quick. We knew yeah. we knew what we wanted to do. It was time to go. And that was the norm back then. Because you don't want to sit sit in a place for long. The guys that could, like Sean, Brett, and Taker, uh stay there was guys that uh two guys that should have never left WWF was Kurt and Brett. Because they were born and bred. Brett, for sure. W, Brett, WWF guys. You know what I mean? That, it, um, that they, they should have never left there. I wish they would have never, but they did. And, and, and stuff happened. But, um, uh, but we did. We, and I'm glad we did because those are the best times uh, we had in our lives or those next years uh, coming into uh, down to with, working back with Turner. We had different clout. We were, you know, we had that run behind us. Ric Flair did the same thing. He jumped up, yep. had a run, and came back the same time as us. We were all back together. And right after we got there, believe it or not, then that 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 revivement thing of the '90, now in '93, '94, was sort of fizzling again. And Vince was then now saying. Uh, let's tell him Randy and Terry, you know, you're, you're sit back, your careers in the ring are over. And we're like, no, they're not. You know, it really made Macho Man mad. I know it made Hawk mad. Now, all of a sudden, here comes our old crew. Now, all the guys, we're down there ready. Here comes behind us. Hawk, Mach, Duggan, Boss Man. The whole, you know, all of us are and I Haku you, and Barb. Do you know what and, I think you know what gave I mean? even, even more credibility was before you had those guys make the big jumps, you had Bobby Heenan and Mean Gene come in first to give fans the yeah. soundtrack that they were familiar with yeah. before you saw Hogan, before you saw Macho and yeah. those types of guys. And then I one, think that really helped. And then once that was there, the company really changed a little bit. It was coming and becoming of its own. It wasn't like it's all the old WWE guys, but... It gave them new life, you know what I mean, and that led into um, the Monday Night War start. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. A story I could tell you is, we came back from Japan, and over and we spent time in Japan. I met Chris Benoit um, with Davy Boy because he they came from Calgary, and earlier, and Chris had a long mullet, and we wrestled them and that kind of stuff. And Chris spent time with us in. Rick Root on the road in Florida, and then he left for Japan. So we, we, we were in Japan with Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, and uh, I, we just flew back, and we mm. already contracted. We signed a big deal with Turner after WWE. We came back from Japan because we were allowed to go both. We had it in our deal. We'd go to Japan we wanted to, go back and forth. And I walked in the center, st I came home, and the phone rang, and it was Eddie. And Eddie just, Eddie was living in El Paso, Sags. Do you think, you know, you know, and this is the God's honest truth. I'm not just saying this. He goes, do you think, uh, do you think you can, you know, mention my name to the guys there? I'd like maybe to try to come into WCW. I go, oh, for sure, Eddie. Hell yeah. Became, we knew Hector Mondo and Chavo from AWA. Oh, who yeah, brought yeah, them yeah. in. We wrestled them and all that kind of stuff. And I think Hector was with us with, uh, he was down there with Bobby Jaggers and them in, in Tennessee with us. So we mm -hmm. knew the whole Guerrero family. So I walk into center stage, and I had that in my, my, my uh, after Japan in my, my, my head. And who's standing up next to the ring? It's Arn Anderson, Kevin Sullivan, and Ric Flair. And Rick came back with us uh, from his run uh, up there. And uh, I said, they go, hey, good, well, you know, welcome back, the whole thing. I said, uh, yeah, great time over there. We're all telling stories about Japan. I go, listen, 
I wanted to tell you, you know, Heck, you know Hector Mondo and Chavo. They got a younger brother, Eddie. And I said, you got to see these guys. And him and Benoit were tagged up over there. You should see these guys work. And I told Kevin Sullivan was booking. And uh, uh, Rick and Arn go, you kidding? Oh, yeah. He goes, they, they want to come in. You ought to call them. Go, Ke Ke Sullivan goes, and we were standing, us four, next to the ring. Kevin Sullivan goes, um, you know, we're making this new show uh, on, um, it's going to be called Nitro to go against Raw. And what I was telling you in another interview, they were look, we're looking for the quick-moving, lightweight guys um, to put in between the big matches so people don't flick the channel back and forth. Right. To keep them in thing, don't, don't go to a boring, Great variety, they'll turn on yeah. WWF's show. You know what I mean? Back, and he goes, oh, that sounds really good. So next, here comes, that, that same day, we wrestled on TV, and um, we were up to re-sign. And we just got back from Japan. Who's sitting in the audience with Ted Turner and Jane Fonda at center stage? And we were, you know, coming off a tour of Japan, you're like a machine. A whole different style of wrestling. Close to AWA, amateurish, uh, hard, but I mean, ba -ba -ba -ba, you're like a, 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 a maniac machine as far as wrestling goes. And we came out and we crisp off the boat from Japan. We were over there for two, three weeks, just annihilated, bam, bam super, and over uh, action pack. Turner sent his guy back, gave me a uh, card, the head, the head of Turner Sports. Uh, Mr. Turner wants you guys signed back resign as soon as possible wow go to the phone and once we had ted say <laughs> say uh you know these guys are here and they're i don't care what anybody says me me and knobs had a ticket to steal <laughs> right, <laughs> we, could, right we could do anything we anything we wanted to do no we could say f off we're doing you know we did whatever we wanted to do but a long thing out of that came and i saw the business work eddie comes in I said, hey, you happy? I, I, and he was just you know, working by himself in that thing. Not a couple years, a year or two later, Eddie, Dean Malenko, and J uh, Chris Benoit turning down five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars a year and telling Turner to get screwed. We're leaving for WWF. Oh well, no, they, you know they what I mean? quit. And, yeah. and the rest yeah. of that, the rest of that's history. And to come back to that same scenario, who came in? When we came back from WW, WWF, uh, who came in as and he wrestled as uh, uh, Paul Levesque, like a uh, uh, he was Jean Paul. Jean Levesque. Paul, yep. yeah. And it was Triple H. Yeah. And he was uh, we we became real close friends. And uh, he was either with Arn and Rick and that crew carrying on, or he hung out with me and all of me and Nobs. And but he, ne he never. Would they, wouldn't drink or party or nothing, but just want to be around all the screwing around going on, laughing and having a fun time. And the same thing happened. And I, I told him that at Ric Flair's birthday party because it came all of a sudden, his turn came. And he was he called me and Nobbs to the back. And he goes, hey, I want to ask you guys because you guys did this before. He goes, Vince McMahon's calling and wants me to go up there. And it was me, Nobs, and him in the, in the back behind the curtains and all that. Well, we go, I said, well, this is what happened to us. All these people said, no, 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 stay and everything. One guy told us not to, and we went, and you got to go. We said, you got to go. And I said, if you go up there, hang around our two best friends. You go and talk to Shawn Michaels, who we brought up in the business with, and Shane McMahon, and you get with him. So I joked with him at Ric Flair's party and said, wow, we never told you to swoon the boss's daughter and take over the company. <laughs> <laughs> we just told you to be friends with our buddies, you know. And that's the God's honest truth. And I, I swear, we sent him up. You know what I mean? Now, now, you know, that's how things in the business happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Another story like that I could tell you that's funny as shit. Me and my wife, we just broke into WWE. And now we knew Diamond mean, Dallas Page because he managed... Uh, Paul and Pat, Pat Tanaka and Paul Diamond, who we had a big street fight run with in Tennessee, it really got over. We were selling out Mid South Coliseum. When we went back to AWA, they followed us in to AWA, and Diamond Dallas Page, um, Diamond Dallas Page, um, uh, Diamond Dallas Page managed them. And uh, what's going on? 
He was just giving me time cues, and I can't see without my glasses. Okay. So, so should I keep ta talking? <laughs> keep going, and, brother. Yeah. Uh, so Diamond Dallas Page managed Paul and Pat in AWA. Wahoo brought him in because he knew him from Florida and stuff like that. And Dusty had him manage the big steel man at Florida Championship Wrestling. Uh, that was Tugboat. He was big steel man in Florida. Mm -hmm. Me and my wife were leaving. The, we weren't even married yet. We're leaving the gym where all of us worked out there. You remember Johnny Green? Johnny Green? Johnny Green was a macho man sidekick. He was a manager in WCW. He owned a gym in, uh, he owned a gym in, um, uh, Johnny in Green. Florida. No, the name doesn't ring a bell. We were leaving there, and I heard a horn blowing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's Diamond Dallas Page and Kimberly. So they pulled me over in the car, and he goes, Hey, brother, what's that? I said, how are you doing? He goes, I see you guys are up in thing. He, he must have been leaving the gym or something. He goes, I said, and he asked, can you get me? I said, Paige, you just can't go, you know, go right up there. I know he was tr really trying hard to go up to the to WWE. And I go, listen, uh, something that was, we were just, I said, we just got in there and we're working. Dusty just left and he went back to WCW. Why don't you call him because he's, you know, that would be a better start. That's how we, we went WCW then there. So Paige did that, and uh, he, Dusty's wife ended up selling, uh, renting him or selling the house right next door. The guy who we met in that came in after being, uh, living in Chicago, worked for AWA as a, in the little office, Eric Bischoff. Paige moves next door to Eric Bischoff, after I told him, you know, and then, you know, we know how it happened to DDP. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you know, he ended up the champion, the whole deal on Jay Leno, the whole nine yards. You talk about how, how, how things happen in the business. Oh, and you they, know I mean? from what I was told, yeah. things were really happening between those two homes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> things were really happening uh, between those about, two homes. I don't know any, anything about that kind <laughs> of shit, but I just know that uh, um, his career blossomed. Then. It sure did. <laughs> But uh, that's how, like I'm saying about the timing is everything. And um, the, uh, uh, that's just the nature of the business. And you got to be, that's why I feel bad, bad sometimes for the, the, uh, the younger kids. Because uh, sometimes they end up hot shot it. Right. Where they go through the training center. And uh, whether you like it or not, you're coming up. We go, do this. And if you're not ready, it, you might, you know, you might, although you didn't didn't work. I mean, you might not ever get that chance again. It's a hard, hard. Because the, now I understand what we were talking about, the old timers, down to television and pay-per-views. There's no more small territories. They tried to recreate that with Louisville and Florida Championship Wrestling and small territories. Booker T had one that the kids could go learn. But it still wasn't the same as like when we went to Tennessee. You were really on your own. Right. You know what I mean? You're making only this much money, and you had to do what you had to do to survive. You're working, driving every night to a different town. No time off. Every day of the week, not a night off for a year in, in Tennessee. Wow. You know what I mean? That's how you learn. That's how you That's really how you, you know what I mean? pay your dues, break so, in, and learn. Yeah. And not only that, but the, the, what they got to go through, just getting through the airports now. Right. You know, we, oh. we, used to, we used to come flying up with the Sheik. Sheik Bubba would take his bags, go hold the gate up. I'd go return the car. Niles would check us in, and we'd all run like OJ to the damn gate, and the, you know, with, through you know security. Now, now you gotta show up three hours early and go through this and that, and it's just get you know when you're you're on a plane every day at five in the morning, six in the morning, every day you're meeting with a flight. Think of putting up what they have to do now, right? I couldn't imagine having to do that. Three or Crazy. four days a week. They, they got a hard, the, the young kids don't have an easy road in, in no. ahead of them with the way the business has transformed. Like I said, it's... It, it, it's uh, The corona has almost been like a vacation for them where they camped out pretty much yeah. in the, for the one event each week in the same city. It's, yeah. It makes it a little easier. Yeah. And you're just producing television. Yeah. You know what I mean? So... When you first got to WWF, when did you learn that you were going to be paired with Jimmy Hart to try and give you a little bit of rub? Oh, that was awesome. We go, um, Jimmy was a great heel manager. I mean, he was with Adrian. I think he was with Earthquake. Yeah. Um, 
And that was that. I'm, I'm almost certain it had to do with Pat. You know, we talking. We had a long talk about Pat Patterson and God bless him passing away and stuff. But it was the the thing, the old school way. How much, the more heat you get on you when you're a heel, the more money you draw. And the money's made by the baby faces chasing those heels. And some of the greatest heel you. Heels in the business are what made the most money in the business. Piper, Roddy Piper told us early on, says, listen, there's no medium. They got to hate you or love you, but you got to do one or the other. If you want to hate, you got to really make them hate you. You can't be in the middle or you're nothing. He told us that. Another thing he told us, Roddy, coming back to Roddy, was going to the ring. Something that was never, never really said that. He goes, when you walk out, the one time that that camera is only on you is that walk from the sh curtain to the ring and what you do. The rest is on a match and everything else. Take your time. Do what you want. And the rest of that came, <laughs> coming back to the old story about Gorilla Ribbon us and that, was when we were in AWA, Schnooker was already there. Adrian Adonis, we picked up at the airport. Bob Orton, we picked up the airport. Coming off that hot early 80s run, they mm -hmm. came in and branched off, took a break, and came in the AWA after that run to work on Burns TVs. One of the first TVs in Minot, South Dakota, that Adrian actually worked on with us. I think we might have drove together or been with him and Kurt or something. Adrian came up to us after a match, goes, so, you're saying you're nasty boy. Well, you're out there grabbing headlocks and thing, and he goes, well, we're like, what do you mean? And all, like, well, you take a pin out of your pocket, stab it in their eyeball, spit in their face, kick them in the balls, take somebody's face and rub it in your partner's armpit. And we went, that's how we got the armpit, by guys like they that, saying, you know, yeah. to make our nasty gimmick, you know what I mean, about the thing. And as coming into the WWE, how do we dump more heat with squealy Jimmy Hart? Hey, baby, baby. And Jimmy is like a real manager to us. You know what I mean? As Fuji was to guys, as Bobby was to guys, mentor. Uh, Jimmy was a, a stickler. We'd be, he, no matter how hungover or whatever, we would be at TV the first ones and get in the interview. Because you had yours, there were 16 interview booths and you had six, 60 interviews to do. 15, 20 in each booth for around the world and all the shows and everybody wrestled in every town. And me and Nobbs and Jimmy, we had a click where we were one take wonders, man. You had to blast those son of a bitches out. If not, you'd be there all day. All day, Because yeah. you had a, and they, we, Jimmy would have us there early on time. He was a stickler for all that extra stuff. The music, the pictures, the photo shoots. Jimmy's idea was he drug us out of bed in Paris, took us down, then he ribbed me. Get all dressed up for this thing. We went down and had a, uh, I forgot his name, the old WWE photographer, met us at the Eiffel Steve Tower. Steve Taylor. Steve Taylor, great guy. He's, he was responsible for all those pictures. We, Jimmy had the idea of us standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. He got on the ground and did an upshot of us and our nasty shit at the Eiffel Tower. It was one of the most iconic, I think, photo shots we ever did for WWE, that one. That kind of stuff Jimmy put together, all that music. That tape with Simon Cowell, the WrestleMania, the nasty yeah. song. All that was Jimmy and the heat that he dumped on us, a pile of it. And that, and that was all Pat's thinking in the old school way. And also with keeping us in the stuff with attacking Warrior when he's going to, the, you know, us doing it and get, dumping more heat on us and adding more excitement to their angle for Warrior and Macho Man going into that uh, SummerSlam match and all that stuff. That's the old school thinking, just like Ole was doing we were talking about, it was just done off the cuff like that. Thinking how to, how, before the match, no writing three months before, nothing right. like that. Pat thinking, we need to put, how do we get more steam on the situation? We need to put some match under the son of a bitch, you know? And he'd throw us into there. When, it, when, 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 when Warriors ready to beat Randy or Sarge or whoever it was, bust into the cage and just start going crazy. And it was crazy. Crazy, and we got heat and tons of heat. People wanted to kill us. What we that meant, we were, as far as remember what Roddy said, we were doing our fucking job. Right. Okay. Exactly. That's what we were there to do, and we did it well. Sometimes 
too rough. Maybe a little too <laughs> rough. Hey, but that's all right. Living the gimmick. <laughs> Your television taping debut, Tampa, Florida, December of 1990. Uh, an infamous incident took place uh, with Marty and Sean. They took on Lanny Poffo, and I believe the man's name was Chad Austin. He broke his neck in the ring, taking the rocker dropper the long way. Yeah. Um, several years later, he was wound up awarded $26 million. I don't think he ever recouped that much, but it wound up costing Marty half a mil out of pocket. Any memories of the injury that took place to the man that night Did on that, your big debut? That may it cost Marty a half a million dollars? It cost him, yeah. Why? Because he sued, I think, both Marty, Sean, and the company. Well, we were, it was our first TV in, and at the time, uh, when it happened, um, we were so enthralled in what we had to do mm -hmm. and what we were doing, I didn't realize something that serious did happen that night, because that, we wrestled, it was North Tampa at, um, the, I think, a USF Sundome. The Sundome, yep. The, yep. Uh, the new center where the lightning play wasn't built yet down in downtown Tampa and the Sun Dome was the spot and um, we were so hung up on what we had to do and get done in our first in our first TV I didn't know that it happened um, I know for a fact that I could say Sean and Marty never hurt anyone in the ring they were just too good of workers um, it was I know they did some type of high-risk move um, I never seen it over I don't know if the kid did something wrong. Um, it was just a uh, rocker dropper, which I you see he, often I enough. actually did see, I did see the thing. And it was a very unexperienced kid mm -hmm. in the ring. I saw, it was something where his head's down, right? The first before, and whoever comes off with the, 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 the rope with the last punch. But he does something first, they do to him. The way he almost positioned his head, like it, it looked like to me like he, I, nobody would want to break their neck, but I'm like, what the F are you doing, kid? Right. That he, there's nothing else that could happen but you to break your neck. Because you just put your face and take the, face, the flat face bump. But like when I, I remember seeing it now in a replay. It was recently somebody, it was shown over on the, I don't know, on YouTube or something. Oh, or, really? But I, watched, I remember seeing it, and it's almost like he, when he was ready to do it, he pointed his head straight down. And it was, that, that's, you got to, when it, in any instance, you got to protect yourself and take your own bump. They're just doing their move. Right. Was it with their feet or something on them? Or he, you they, run up and you put the leg over the guy's yeah, head. The head would be kind of down. under the knee and you go straight down. But I, re I remember seeing him going, putting his head to where nothing could happen but an injury out of it. You know what I mean? Now, whose fault is that? The kid was green, and back then they used those type of guys in those uh, enhancements, the enhancement they roles, called it yeah. matches. Do you want to see somebody get hurt like that? Fuck no, it's a horrible thing. But I know in my heart that Sean and Marty would never hurt somebody purposely, and they never, you, I mean, them guys were such good workers, you would never even know, you know what I mean, uh, that you're getting hit or anything by them, you know what I mean? 500K uh, it, even now would be a lot of money, never mind 1990. I didn't know that that, that, that cost him that, that, that kind of thing. I thought that... Uh, you know, because it happened in the ring. I don't know the laws back then. You know what I mean? I, di I didn't know that. But that's a lot a lot of cash that if Marty had to pay that, it sucks. Yeah. It does suck. Because I don't know why it would be on him. You know what I mean? I don't. Right. But I, I don't. But actually, at, at the time, I don't remember it. I don't remember it happening. The, law, I know, the, the trial and whatnot didn't take place until you guys were already back in WCW. It was 94 when it was all settled. Oh, uh, we were gone. But the incident bro. took place, in the, like you said, the night you debuted in December of 90. Yeah, yeah. And then you started to work uh, the house show loop after you did a few TVs to become familiar with the fans. Your first regulars on the house shows were Luke and Butch the yeah, Bushwhackers. Yeah, Your memories of uh, working with our uh, friends well, from down under. Well, at first I was worried, you know, um, that... Coming off of, you think about, um, because really, Butch and Luke were great. They were the sheep herders. Ultra violent. They, they, they were doing like what we were doing when they were younger. Right. But, you know, the Bushwhacker thing was more of a little of uh, the yay and thing like that. But, so I thought, is this going to be like a more of a, a, a joking around to take off the seriousness we had going with the Steiners and in the, the kind of thing? 
So we just did our nasty thing on Butch and Luke, and we, we became best friends, and it even got more heat because those assholes, they're just these guys that want to have fun and love the people, and, and we'd beat the living shit out of them. But I'll tell you what, but they would, they, those Scud missiles were coming, <laughs> you know, because the, the war happened right, and right. all that. And Butch came back and goes, mate, I thought I got hit with a Scud missile. So we were, the, the whole thing, we were called, they, then Butch started, uh, Luke, Scudder. They call us Scudder because we would attack them from behind. It felt like, oh, because they were used to that. <laughs> it felt like, it felt like someone, like <laughs> a Dick Buckus was nailing them from, you know, from what they're used to working at. But we had great matches with them. It got over. And to this day, they're two of our best friends and two of the greatest guys you ever want to meet in life. And that's how we started, but it, it was a, a stepping stone of learning how to get heat on that type of guy, and it was basically, you know, ripping them apart. You know what I mean? We put over their stuff, for you know, and then we did our thing, and it it just built heat and made the people mad that what we did to them, you know, we were pretty violent. So and the, perfect, they were kind of the 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 undercard of the name tag team, so to speak. So yeah, they, they were the I would say probably the best team for you to work with to get you guys over at first. Yeah, I, I like I said at first, I'm like, well, how, I don't know how this is going to work, but it ended up being okay. You know what I mean? Because we moved on to other stuff, and but it was a really it was it was just a it was just a getting starting type thing around the loop and getting to know the company and working and stuff like that. You know, but we had some, we had some tremendous matches where, and I remember one and Chief J Strongbow coming up and going, see what I told you, because we were, you know, at first we struggled with a little bit doing the, they would do the running, you know, the headbutt stuff and the different things. And we were in Hershey, PA, which mm -hmm. is close to our hometown. That where it has that like three, 4,000 seat hockey arena, mm -hmm. the close up field people thing. Where I, then I it came, came back to me watching Buddy Rose and the Rockers, that type of thing, and where you, we were allowed to do that, even in the house show, you could do that type yeah, of match. Yeah, a little more liberty. I said, that's the way we got to go. You know what I mean? Walk and talk and thing, and we, we don't want to get in there. We're scared. And then when we do, we just we lay into them and let them, you know, and it just flowed and worked. And Chief J goes, see, you're worried about that. And he goes, oh, that was a great match. He's told him, Chief J Strongo told me that. He goes, and it felt good. I know we had the people like this. It was with Butch and Luke. So after that, it was like a, we went a couple times. We went a little rough. And then after that, it just flowed. You know what I mean? It was like a day at the park. You know? Good. And they're, they're, like I said, Sean and Marty, friends for life. Butch and Luke, friends for life. Hawk and Animal, friends for life. A lot of great teams for you to work with when you came in right off the oh, bat. Oh, God. I, he, he, uh, um, uh, Coco and Owen. Then a little it was, later on, yeah. Then it was uh, it was Owen and Jim. Yeah. Because Brett went on his own. They branched Jim off and put him and Owen together. Yeah. Which the worked new good. Foundation. That worked good too. We, we had great times with them. Uh, but the tag team, the whole realm of it. Then Ted and Mike, which were put together because of the money thing, which made sense. Yeah. When uh, Vince made Mike Rotundo to give him more color, the shyster guy, with Ted with the money guy. You know I mean, I don't know if Virgil was in there at that time. That I would think he was wrestling on his own. He was a babyface single on, by that yeah, point. Right. Yeah. But I remember wrestling Virgil and Terry Carey Von Eric. Those weren't the. Those weren't like Lou Fez Matt classics. <laughs> put, it, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> All right, wrestling fans. Yeah. I'm getting the cue from the back. Unfortunately, we got to wrap up this episode. But don't worry, Jerry is going to be back with us for more. We want to know what you think. Leave your thoughts. Uh, and comments in the description below. The more you guys engage with us, the more you want to see Jerry and Brian Nobbs, the more we're going to bring them back. For Jerry Sags, I'm Dan Marotti. Until we speak again, folks, you and yours stay healthy. More important, be well. Good be night. Be nasty. The World Wrestling Federation was live at Whitley Bay Ice Rink in Newcastle, England, Wednesday, February the 3rd, 1993. In the opening contest, Virgil beat Repo Man. Model Rick Martel victorious over Max Moon, who replaced Marty Jannetty. Bam Bam Bigelow defeated the Big Boss Man.
The Nasty Boys with the win over WWF Tag Team Champions Money Incorporated via disqualification. The Head Shrinkers beat the Bushwhackers. The Undertaker victorious over Papa Shango. And in the main event, WWF World Champion Brett Hitman Hart retained the title over the Nature Boy Ric Flair, who was on his final tour before returning to WCW later in the month. If you are in Newcastle Live, share your memories in the comment section below. Use the links in the description box to keep wrestling legends working in our eBay store and on our acclaimed Patreon streaming service so we can bring you more interactive superstar shoot interviews to relive the good old days of professional wrestling. Check it out. Boston Wrestling Sports and the MWF explodes into a new year with professional wrestling content galore and need you to join our family. Every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. after our Monday Night Raw review, it's Wrestling Inside Us at your house with WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas. Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. after NXT and AEW, join rotating legends on Wrestling Insiders Special Edition. Every Thursday night at 10 p.m. after our NXT and Dynamite review, it's Marty Jannetty's No Holds Barred Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Journey on Wrestling Insiders Party with Marty. Friday night after SmackDown, don't miss John Cena Sr.'s Wrestling Insiders Fabulous Fridays. Plus, look for classic clips, history videos, bonus live episodes, pay per view, watch alongs, and more. For less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks, get early ad free access to our Wrestling Insider talk shows, our acclaimed studio shoot interview DVD library, and help keep wrestling legends working during the worst of times. Join our growing family at patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling. Expect the unexpected in 2021.